Yeah, hello everybody. Welcome to our webinar on the Universal Standard Archive file for absorption data. We just wait a few more minutes until all the registered people come in and then we will start. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you're all healthy on a Friday afternoon in Europe and a Friday morning in the US and Friday midnight probably in the Asias. Thank you for attending and um, thank you for being with us today discussing the standard archiving of absorption data. Just a few more minutes, please allow for a few more minutes to let all people come in before I start. <clears throat> thank you for attending today. And I'm also looking forward to the discussion today. For those of you who are not familiar with the system, there is a, in the panel, there is a section where you can enter questions. And I would kindly ask you to enter questions there so that I will collect them. And in the end of the session, um, we can discuss a few uh, questions. Yeah, we have also as uh, panelists, we have today Jack Evans, Dr. Jack Evans, but we will, we also invited Dan Siderius. Um, Dan, I'm not sure if you want to say hello just uh, to the audience. Dan Siderius is the secretary of the International Absorption Society. He will be also, he gave a presentation on a similar topic on Monday that was also quite well attended and he will be also available for the discussion. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Stefan and Jack for allowing me to participate. I hope that this is a, a fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much. Okay, then I think we will start. I will just say a few words of the for the motivation today. So the motivation really comes from the importance of adsorption, the scientific field of adsorption, Porous materials play a key role in many applications, energy related applications, separation applications, environmental applications and adsorption data in different formats are collected all over the world. And you publish your excellent adsorption data in high level journals with high impact and um, at all levels for all kinds of applications. Um, but one of the limitations still is that these uh, published adsorption data are in many cases, visual data are graphs um, that are not digital data. And um, we are considering at the moment to improve this scenario because many people, companies, industrialists in the world also want to make use of excellent data. And it will be much more precise to evaluate advanced adsorbents for specific applications if digitized data are really available at high quality. And so this initiative is really to improve the reporting of uh, quality and data in the field of adsorption. And uh, our presenter today is Dr. Jack Evans, who is currently a postdoc and Alexander von Humboldt fellow at the Technical University Dresden. Um, and he has developed this new standard archive for um, archive file at Technical University Dresden together with my group. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Stefan Kaskel. I'm head of the inorganic chemistry department, but I'm also chair of the International MOF um, Commission of the ISA board. And uh, this is also an, is an initiative basically to improve the reporting of adsorption data for metal organic frameworks and other advanced adsorbents. So with this, Jack, I don't want to steal your time. Um, this is a tutorial, so please enjoy it. And Jack, the floor is yours. All right, so thank you very much, Stefan, for an excellent uh, introduction. And good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone who's uh, attending. Um, this is a great opportunity, and I'd like to thank you all for um, yeah, thinking about how we can make uh, our data more accessible and, uh, you know, make adsorption information um, 
you know, freely available for everyone to use beyond the, our initial uh, reporting. So <clears throat> not long ago, I think this is the type of pitch that we used to have for science information, is this jumbling of data put around in a library in no real organized way. And if you think about trying to find information in this type of library, where it's not really organized, um, it could take a lot more effort and a lot more time for you to find that, you know, advance or that scientific um, information that could lead to a new discovery. And so some, this is something I think we have to consider when we're uh, reporting our data and um, thinking about that in the future is that how do we want our data to be used by other people? Do we want other people to walk into our literature and think of a, a pitch like this? Or would we like our information to be easily accessible, findable, and allow them to find that new information that we might have overlooked? So <clears throat> we can consider this as, uh, sorry, in the past, Wilkinson et al. and others have kind of guided us in ways to manage our data to allow them to be, or allow this data to be better accessible and to allow others to better find this information, to use this for their advantage and also our advantage. And these principles that were outlined by Wilkinson et al. are the fair guiding principles. And this fair guiding principles means that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So basically our data shouldn't be, should be persistently identified. So you can find that in the jungle, which is the information online. They should be accessible in a way that not only can they be found, but that you should be able to easily download that information or um, use that information. Um, interoperable means that they should be able to be uh, transferred into some other different formats. So consider this as downloading a file and using it in something like Excel, Python, or your other favorite spreadsheet application. Um, and not just that, they should be then reusable. So when we deposit our information in the literature, we should consider that this information should not just be used once and that people should be able to download or use this information in metadata analyses and to really find more information than that was there to just begin with. So <clears throat> when I was uh, set out on this uh, project by Stefan, I was really thinking about how fair is absorption data at the moment. And to kind of put this in perspective, let us consider if we're in this position that I was reading this article um, that was published a while ago in uh, Agavante for a mesoporous metal-organic framework called the UT6, which has this nice structure here. And in this article, I was scrolling through the article and I found that it has this nice mesoporous kind of nitrogen isotherm with these nice steps. And there's a, the article itself does not, um, does not state a BET surface area or a BET area for this um, isotherm. So I wanna make one myself. So how could I do that? And so this is the type of uh, thing that could happen quite a lot because not all information is in the article and you might want to reprocess this isotherm to do all, your, all different types of analyses. So <clears throat> the way that you would do this is uh, uh, just showing you an example here where I've recorded just to see how long it would take. Um, I've got paper here and I scroll down, I see the isotherm that I like and to use this isotherm and to get the information from this isotherm, I have to digitize it. And we digitize this in a way that we basically take a screenshot of this isotherm I then open a digitizer application, such as Webplot Digitizer, which is great for this uh, process. So we open up this, uh, <laughs> this application. We uh, load the image into Webplot Digitizer. And I find it. And then once we have uploaded this uh, plot or this screenshot, we then just have to pick the axes. So to find where um, on this image do zero and one relate to. 
I'm just going to skip forward a few because you can see this takes a bit of time. Uh, once we've set our limits to our plot, we then have to go through and click each and every point in this plot. So <clears throat> I'll scroll through because this takes, as you can imagine, a little bit of time, um, especially if you have 100 or so points in your absorption information. Um, then we do the same thing for desorption. Uh, so we go through again. And only after we've done all these steps do we end up with a information for the absorption information that we could then graph in our own programs and then perform those analyses. And I think one of the things we have to remember is how much time and how fiddly this is. So this took me seven minutes. And so that's seven minutes from seeing an isotherm, digitizing it, and then having the raw data, you know, really on the page. And seven minutes is an awfully long time. I could do a lot more things in seven minutes. Um, so for example, there are 28 other things I could possibly do in an office in seven minutes time, such as a uh, ride around an office <laughs> in a bicycle. Not just that, reading this article took two minutes. So seven minutes is a ridiculous amount, a long amount of time to just digitize a plot just to check if a BT area could be fit to this isotherm. And this is not a problem that uh, I've faced alone. The isotherms that are um, in the NIST RPE adsorption database, which is over 30,000 different isotherms, a gr great proportion of these isotherms have been digitized in the same way. So you can consider the, the extent of labor and time that it would take to digitize, you know, tens of thousands of isotherms. And this time is not just the time investment that this takes, sorry, is that how much quality is this data that's been digitized? And so even by digitizing a linear isotherm plot, you can notice that we lose a lot of information in this low pressure region. And digitizing the plot may not be a big deal if we were only looking at uh, high pressure regions, maybe fitting such so, something like a BET area. However, if we really cared about Henry's coefficients or something that where low pressure information is truly important, we can see that there is a loss of information by just simply digitizing it off a um, isotherm plot from the paper using that approach. So this leads us to a point that if we wanted to make our data more fair and more accessible for people to use in the future, what can we do? So we could simply include the tabulated data in the manuscript or in the supporting information. And then I could, you could easily copy that information across into some kind of processor. Uh, you could add the plotted information as um, Excel spreadsheets or as comma separated value formats into the supporting data as well. Uh, which is easily then downloaded and then you could you know you uh, perform your analyses as you see fit or alternatively we could upload the adsorption information data files so raw data files straight from the um, experiment and ideally within this um, adsorption data file we have all the metadata that is associated with the experiment so the idea would be that these um, data files could be could um, include all the information we need to really understand what this isotherm represents. And this is the um, real challenge that I was set out, is that I think this is probably the best way, is that to, um, to be as transparent as possible. And that means to upload the data files that are associated with the absorption. But this is technically, or this is currently quite difficult because there's several different formats that um, instruments output information as. So <clears throat> we've set out to outline a format which is more universal to describe this information. And one of the formats that we took a huge amount of inspiration from, which I think we can agree is ubiquitous in um, scientific or in material science, is the crystallographic information file. And so this crystallographic information file is the format that is used to do, um, share and report crystallographic data and specifically things like single crystal data, which um, represent structural information of, that have been identified for different materials. 
And we can see an example here that with just this um, text file, which can be read by a machine or by, by just a simple text editor, we can then digitize or from this, uh, from this simple file, it has all the information that's required to have three dimensional coordinates in addition to the experimental information um, representative of this crystal structure. So I thought this was a, an excellent place to start um, when it comes to a format which is widely used and can hold an extreme large amount of information. And so the SIF um, or the crystallographic information file is really based on this star format. And the star format stands for a self-defining text archive and retrieval file or format. And so the basics of this format is that you basically have a data name and a data value. And these um, are pairs so that any data value you have is self or is defined by the data um, item or the data name before it. So we can see here as an example, we have a data value called star file, which is a name. And we can see that it's associated with this data, um, data name format. So we can say the format is the star file. Um, similarly for something like a number. So if we have the data name first published, we can then relate that to this data value of 1991. And not only can it have these pair or a pair of information, it can also have um, list type information, which is done here using loops, where we specify a loop, then we specify one or more items, and then down the loop, we have the list of information. So in this way, you could, in the SIF file, you can have X, Y, Z coordinates of different atoms within your crystal structure. So now that gives us a, a good starting point to use this star format to represent something like an absorption um, experiment. Typically something like this isotherm here where we have pressure against amount absorbed. Um, so the problem is that a lot of the SIF data names don't really work for adsorption information. And in fact, that's not what they're defined for. They're, they're perfect for describing crystal structure and um, parts of the experiment work, which comes to identifying crystal structures, but not for adsorption information. So we have to go through and define a new dictionary of data names and their descriptions so that we can then represent a um, adsorption experiment. Um, and you can find this uh, up-to-date data uh, name dictionary on the uh, GitHub that's associated with this project, um, uh, adsorption information format GitHub. But I think it's better to go through and show this, you, uh, show this to you as an example in a actual file. So here we have an adsorption information file, which is associated with uh, a nitrogen adsorption experiment. And so what we have, you know, we have comment lines, which are specified by the pound or the hashtag symbol. So anything that start, any line that begins with this symbol is just a comment line and you can comment anything in that line. Um, so that is not read by any computers. Um, we then open the information with a, or we open the data block, data underscore some value. Um, and then we have the experimental values or the experimental data values. And so these are all related to data names that um, represent the experiment. So we have things like the operator name, um, the date that the experiment occurred, the instrument, some description of the instrument, the absorptive, which in this case is nitrogen, the temperature and the sample mass. Following this, we then have information about the sample. And so we can have a unique sample ID which represents the sample and then some material ID, which is some way to reference this um, sample to some material that is known in the literature. Um, then we have a series of data names and values which are associated with units. So these define which units we're talking about when we specify a temperature, a mass, pressure or loading. 
Following this, we then have loops which define the adsorption branch. So in this case, we have adsorption pressure, the saturation pressure um, re referred to as P0, and the amount adsorbed. Then we have, we have the um, desorption branch following after that. But then I also state that these don't have to be by order necessarily. You can have your units first, experiment, information next. It's really um, up to you how you arrange this information. So what I have to state though, though, is that this is really the first dictionary. <laughs> this is not a perfect dictionary to represent all different types of adsorption information. Um, we're looking at improving this dictionary each day um, and we're looking to extend this dictionary in the very soon or in the very near future to include more information as we've uh, discussed with the community. So today you may have many different um, raw output files or adsorption experiments that you've already conducted and you have data files that you have based from or outputted from the experiment um, outputted from the instrument and you could you could technically just take this information and using a text editor create the um, AIF yourself but we noticed that this um, is no good use of your time it may not take you seven minutes but it will still take you longer than it probably should so we um, put together or developed a program for Windows computers called raw to AIF and this um, program will go through and convert Quantochrome, Bellsor Max files and Micromerdix files to um, the absorption information file. And it will take as much information as it can from these um, raw output files to create a representative AIF. You can then go through and look at this in a text editor or plot this information and, you know, include more information or less information depending on uh, what you want to do. So I'm showing you here an example of how to use this raw to AIF program. Um, all it needs is something like this Quantachrome um, raw output file shown here. And so you can see that it has the adsorption information for the um, entire isotherm. Then all you need to do is browse for this file name. So in Mac computers, you can drag, uh, you can drag that across, which is great. You just out input some material ID to um, specify which material this is. Then all you have to do is specify the file type. So this, in this case, it's a quantachrome.txt file. And then you click convert and it's uh, correctly done. And we have a uh, correct, or it was able to do this completely. Um, in the status output, if you have any errors, which you're bound to probably have errors, you can put, um, you can send to me that status output and we see why there's an error. And you can see now that we have this nicely formatted AIF, um, AIF file <laughs> with all the information that uh, you could glean from just the raw output file. Cool. So you can download this uh, program um, today or anytime you like. Um, it is con constantly being updated. So even this version 0.0.4 has since been updated to 0.0.5. Um, and we're looking to update this almost every week, depending on how many bugs people find. And it's really up to you as users to um, use this information or to use this program. And then if you have problems to send me uh, an email with the file that has not been able to be converted. Um, and only by doing that can we improve the, um, the robustness of this program to work for more and more types of uh, files. So I've already mentioned that um, the first dictionary doesn't have all the data names that we may want, um, and especially not all the data names that you as a community may need. So in the future, we're looking at revising or producing a version two of this dictionary, which includes a lot of the information that people have or people require to describe different types of um, adsorption experiments. 
Um, so some of the data names we're thinking of or we'll be adding to the dictionary include experimental notes and sample notes. And so experimental notes could be used to define um, information about the degas conditions of the um, adsorption experiment. Similarly, the sample notes could define um, information about the sample preparation. So for example, what activation conditions were um, were undertaken or whether there's presence of binder, those type of things. Um, we can also add data names that define which kind of method is used for the adsorption. So whether it's volumetric, gravimetric, or even a simulation, um, which is representative of the um, information. Um, we can also add things like loading site to specify whether it's an excess, net, or total adsorbed um, amount. And similarly, add things like sample density so that we can start to uh, correctly describe um, high pressure subcritical um, adsorption. And you can um, look at this uh, proposed changes to the dictionary in the revision to um, branch of the adsorption information format GitHub. So you can see what we're thinking of adding in, become part of the conversation and suggest maybe if we're, we need more data names that are for you or data names that you need to describe the experiment to, to, to describe your experiment more completely. We're also thinking about how flexible that this, um, this AIF format is. Um, so for example, one of the things I think is really interesting is the history dependent adsorption or how adsorption changes with different cycles. And so, <clears throat> for example, in the experiment here, for three cycles of adsorption, we have three different um, isotherms. So we can define different cycles of adsorption in one single AIF by simply having a data block associated with run one and a um, data name called experimental run number, which, which tracks which um, cycle we're in. So for example, this shows the information for cycle one. And then if we go further down the file, we have a <clears throat> new data block called run two, which specifies the information for the um, next run number. And you can think about how this could be used to describe um, sequential um, adsorption experiments. We can also looking at how we can describe mixture adsorption. And so here is an example of a way that we could describe a volumetric chromatic graphic experiment. Um, and this is an example of a propane propylene um, experiment where we've specified using a um, uh, underscore one or underscore two for the two different species in this case. Um, this could be extended to three or so, um, where we specified the, um, the species of the absorptive, their mole fraction. And then in the adsorption branch or the adsorption branch, we just have the total pressure and the pressure of each and the amount adsorbed for each, um, for each species. But it's just this um, just highlights how flexible that this format could be for describing different types of um, adsorption experiments. Um, and I've been developing this um, in collaboration with Dol, uh, Dr. Paul uh, Comey. So I think I've taken up enough of your time to describe <laughs> why I think this format is important and hopefully why you should use it. Uh, to summarize, AIF is a flexible an extremely flexible data format for describing adsorption experiment. The, all that's important is these data names that are in that dictionary, and then you can define, or you can then describe all types of, all different parts sorry, of your experiment. So you can produce or edit AIFs using your favorite text editor, or you can use the raw to AIF program. And hopefully this outlines a better future for the sharing of adsorption um, information so that we can all not throw away our adsorption information and use it for, um, for, for other people in the community. So finally, I'd like to, uh, like, yeah, finally I'd like to acknowledge that people have helped me um, in this project. Um, so that's, uh, of course, Professor Stefan Kaskill, um, 
and Dr. Arena Senskovska and Dr. Vladimir Bond from TU Dresden, who really have uh, put together this uh, initial revision. Um, I've been funded by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and I haven't been able to create this raw AIF file myself. I'm a raw to AIF program myself. I'm not a very good programmer, so I've been very thankful for help from Renko and Dr. Paula Okomi, who have really helped putting together this um, this program and the passing of you know different raw output files. And finally, if you'd like to you know become part of this uh, community and uh, help us improve the raw to AIF file, you can join the uh, hub link and download the source files and work to it to your heart's content. So thank you everyone, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Jack, for this uh, great presentation and uh, very nice tutorial. There are already a few questions in the chat, but I would also like to ask uh, Dan Ziderius to join us here in the panel discussion today. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, maybe Dan, if you could put on your micro, Turn on your micro and uh, camera. Uh, welcome, uh, Dan Ziderius. Dan Ziderius is uh, who probably most of you know him from NIST, from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And he's also the secretary of the International Adsorption Society. Dan Ziderius, I would say, has pioneered the establishment of an adsorption database at NIST. And um, uh, Dan has also pioneered uh, the International Adsorption Society YouTube uh, series, which was very uh, good, I think, in the pandemic also to give information and, and discuss latest uh, research in the field of adsorption. Welcome, uh, Dan, and thank you for joining the discussion today. Um, maybe I can start reading a few questions from the chat and uh, one of you can comment on it. So there are two similar questions in the uh, chat basically asking for visualization tools. So um, Frank Hoffmann is asking, are there also plans to develop a specialized visualization program for AIF files? Yeah, so <clears throat> this, uh, this format, I mean, you can easily uh, copy and paste this information into Excel if you'd like to visualize this information. However, using known Python libraries, we can create a um, PDF of this graph information in three lines or so. Um, and also, Dr. Paul Iacomi is building a graphical user interface to some of his um, really powerful uh, code, which will allow you to fit BET service areas and information like that. So, look for the future for uh, some kind of graphical user interface to graph this information. But I mean, yeah, because you can open this with a text editor, I think it's also just as easy to copy and paste this into something like Excel. Yeah, I think Rama Octavian is pointing in the same direction. And uh, my feeling is that the community would is requesting this already to have an AIF viewer so that basically the extracted information can be also um, uh, seen. Frank Hoffmann is also pointing out that we have in the crystallographic community the the program Mercury, which is also a free program uh, which allows to import a zip file and then you can easily view the structure. And I think this is probably also an important step to, to have an AIF viewer or a simple viewing uh, software which allows you to uh, basically look at your data. Okay. Um, yeah, certainly. I think there there is a push in the community for this, and so that's something that we'll definitely uh, try to uh, to to achieve. I think it's a good input from the community. Then uh, Felix Brila from Hamburg is asking: Are other uh, file formats from Quantachrome Instruments like QPS also already convertible? So unfortunately, not QPS files. So QPS files are an example of a binary format. And so binary formats are sort of locked. And so you can only open them if you know the, the way that that file is arranged. So unfortunately, QPS for, um, files will not be able to be converted in this way. Um, and so I think the onus will eventually be to instrument manufacturers for them to be able to output directly 
um, the AIF format. I, I would also support this very much. I think we should also um, yeah, convince man machine manufacturers not to yeah. uh, produce files that are not transparent, but to produce files that really show what the instrument is doing and what the instrument is, is measuring. Okay, great. Then please feel free to raise your hand whenever you, or, uh, whenever you want to comment. Then uh, Ayat Saka is asking, is the AIF also available for dynamic flow systems containing different gases? So I think this is for my understanding for mixture phase adsorption in a dynamic flow. Mm -hmm. um, so if you'd like to contact me and share with me a uh, output file for a dynamic flow experiment, I'd be happy to um, see how we could arrange the format to describe this information. So yeah, I think one of the, we're at a point here where the information or where the format is extremely flexible. So we don't have, well, we only have very limited examples so far, but if you can think of an example, um, share it with me and we'll, we'll arrange how best to um, describe this information. There is a very important input also from Atanasios Kotsianos. Um, are there any plans to provide the option to report adsorption equilibrium criteria in the AIF file? Yeah, so, so that, that would represent something like uh, equilibrium time as for each point, or would that be just an entire experimental, or uh, <laughs> I guess uh, something that is defined for the entire experiment? Yeah, I think for each point, probably. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. this is a... So, a bit... yeah, if, this is um, something that is possible. But we have to really consider how much um, experimental information do we want to save um, and how much is uh, do you want to share. So, um, at the moment, we've been trying to find the, I guess, the most pertinent information or the most important information that people would like to um, present. But in the future, we can continue adding more and more data names to describe as many different parts of the experiment or as many different um, types of experiments um, that other people are doing. Mm -hmm. I think that's a... Uh... Dan, do you want to comment on this? Or is this uh, in the sure. NIST database? Um, so what I would add to that is that Jack has like very, very, I think, intelligently structured the loops in a way that extra data about every single point can be added. Um, in, in a sense, every line in the loop structure is an individual experimental measurement. And so if there was a, like an equilibrium time that was changing on a point by point basis, that could be added as an additional column. Um, and so in, in, in our NIST database, we have kind of the same approach in that each measurement is, cons is, is in kind of encoded independently. And so with these key value dictionary type approaches, then you can just add additional information there. Um, today, we've been talking a bit about the kind of the essential data descriptors, uh, but we could, end users could have any sort of other descriptors that can be added to this, as long as they don't conflict with the key kind of words in this dictionary. Um, and so that's one of the really big benefits of going with a key value approach like this um, and allowing users to kind of customize it to their own end needs as long as they don't conflict with some of the underlying uh, vocabulary words. Thank you. Um, then there's one uh, question from Robert Eschrich. Um, would it be useful to implement this conversion in the manufacturer's instrument software or would it contradict the flexibility and future developments of the format? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see any problem with that necessarily i think we have to find at least a first a first version where the the bare minimum information is is defined in our dictionary so that it can define or it can be described for volumetric information so at this point the i think it would be great for instrument manufacturers to be able to output this type of format but it's for in the future, we will just have to we'll be able to extend this format to describe more and more types of information that um, perhaps this um, 
initial outputs um, don't capture. Mm -hmm. And then we have one question from Leo Scott Blankenship. I think this is also a very interesting question. So AIF may be used for uh, quite a variety of materials where maybe also more description about the synthesis and processing of the material is required. So um, of course it's a difficult question, but what do you think are the limits uh, to expand the data types used in this format in terms of describing the material? Yeah, I mean, if if that's something that is important for you, I think you can include that um, that in your own dictionary. So I think there's there's two ways, as um, Dan kind of pointed to, is that we're looking to define kind of a core dictionary that works for you know ninety percent of um, experiments. But there's always going to be the experiments that require or you it, that yourself want to archive important information um, that is potentially not uh, used for anybody else. So I think in this case, we could define, or you, yourself could define a, a dictionary that you use for your information. As long as you've defined that somewhere, um, then you could use, you know, five or six lines to specify every part of your, um, of your materials characterization or your materials um, synthesis. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think this is also a core question. The descriptor for the material is not an easy question how to name the material properly. Yeah, and this is why we, I kind of thought that for the next version, we're going to add lines for experimental information and lines for sample information. So um, that, that already gives you uh, gives some ability to define you know, parameters or um, yeah, synthesis routes, but uh, yeah, but, I mean, yeah, you can always add more information. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, very useful. Um, Norbert Stock is asking, will there be a database like the CCDC? Uh, I think we're at very early days. <laughs> but um, I guess the first point to uh, making a CDC or something like that for basically benefiting other databases out there is by having this type of format so you can straightforwardly add your information to either new databases or um, existing databases. I think this is something that Dan is considering or is looking at for um, the NIST RPE um, database is that there is now an online form that you can add your information to, but it would benefit us in the future for larger databases of experimental information that um, all the information is in the same format will definitely help. Um, is that about right, Dan? <laughs> uh, so I'll answer that in multiple ways. Uh, first of all, if people can put AIF files in their in their papers, even today, we could directly convert it to the NIST database format and have it entered into the database there already. Um, in terms of how much data we carry around, um, that perhaps is a, is a larger question because the repository um, right now is limited in terms of the database schema that we use. Uh, we would not be able to carry around the extra material information present. Uh, but that could be solved with even just simple data repositories uh, using a, a Git format. Um, there's many different ways to deal with that. With, with that, uh, I would say, I mean, call it a problem, but it's actually more of an opportunity. Uh, because it gives us a way to then circulate this information to everyone very easily. I think the, okay. the short answer on that too is that we will see a converter to the NIST database format available very, very soon. As soon as some of the core vocabulary, vocabulary is set in place, we'll be able to make that conversion immediately. Oh, that's great. Glad to hear this. This is wonderful. It's also new for me, this information. Super. <laughs> Um, Lee Bremer is also asking a question which is related to this uh, topic. It's a very good question. Um, we've also been thinking about this. The, the value of the ZIF file is also that there is a program, program called Check ZIF, which checks the quality of the ZIF files um, or checks inaccuracies, in con consequences, and problems with the format or if something has not been filled out properly. So I guess Lee, you're probably asking, will there be a Czech AIF program? Yeah, and I think that's um, that's important. And I think once 
Dan, or well, yeah, we're currently in conversation with Dan and um, people from UPFL to define what is the bare amount of information required in a format or in a file like this. And I think once we've defined what the bare amount of information is, then at least that's one check that is able to be performed. But then the next check I think is a bit more, uh, would be a bit le or more provisional, right? Is how much uh, amount is required for an absorption experiment does, you know, is the leak checks correct? Um, it really defined, depends on how much information we uh, require. And I think this um, comes to the next or the next steps um, for this format is if we wanted to create something like the CDC or a CCDC, um, we then need to put a value on how um, how good or how correct this uh, this experiment is. But <clears throat> I guess we're still at the initial stages where we're just trying to find what information is uh, is necessary. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I think we are still at an early stage, but I think it's a very valuable point uh, Lee Bremer is making. Um, the next mm -hmm. question comes from Ashley Fletcher. I think this is also a difficult, challenging question in the sense to realize it, um, but they use a gravimetric system and this system also provides equilibrium profiles for each adsorption step. So basically kinetic information, how quickly the equilibrium is achieved. And the obvious question is, will there be a way in the future to also uh, include such data in the in the catalog? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So yeah, as Dan said, we because we have a loop here where every experimental point, we can have data names associated with that experimental point. So at the moment, it's only pressure, saturation pressure and amount absorbed, but we could easily add time to equilibrium, those type of things. Then one comment from Leo Scott Blankenship. Perhaps there should be AIF dictionary specific to material categories. For example, IF MOF, IF carbons, AIF zeolite, etc. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's an excellent idea. Because uh, yeah, I think once we have a core dictionary, then it's yeah, what um, data names are really important for you know yeah carbon types and uh, and that so. That's more of a that will really define the sample um, sample specific dictionaries, but yeah, that's a good idea. And then Yun Shu Ha is asking, um, thanks for the great tutorial. I really think so many calculation methods of BT surface are also issues in this field. So the difficulties in calculating or, or quoting BT surface areas, it may require complete agreement of related researchers. And so I guess the question is, do you have a plan to give guidance for this issue to have researchers agree on guidelines? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think there is a paper on Chem Archive at the moment, which is the challenges of, I guess, applying the BET um, approach to these type of, or to mesoporous large framework materials. But um, I think this really points to why we need a, <clears throat> a format like this is that we could more easily um, test and reanalyze data that are provided in papers or are provided in initial manuscripts, right? <clears throat> we you only know how good a, it's very difficult at the moment to see how good a BET analysis is. Um, but if you could apply your own BET analysis to um, adsorption information that are in a paper or in a paper you're reviewing, I think this provides a greater amount of transparency and will allow us to hold, I guess, the community to a, a greater um, standard. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think this, I hope I didn't for, overlook any questions. So there were quite a number of questions, but uh, I think I, we answered most of them. And actually many of them were also uh, comments and input. So I think 
this input is very valuable for improving this format further and we will take this into account into further steps and, and in the next uh, steps. So I think we are now at the end and it's also Friday afternoon in Europe. So then I think we should close the discussion or um, yeah, or maybe I can ask my uh, uh, panelists here to have a final statement. Do you, do you want to have a final statement from your side, uh, Dan, maybe? Um, all I would add is that uh, this approach needs community support. And so Jack has already set up a GitHub repository where issues can be raised, comments can be made. Uh, please become part of the conversation because your use cases uh, can be, in a sense, prioritized or made as subsidiary standards, like the idea of AIF MOF or AIF Zeolite or AIF Carbon. Um, and so it's better to have feedback from users because then we can work these ideas into what ultimately is developed as an AIF vocabulary for the future. Great, thank you. Yeah, I fully agree. Jack, how about you? Exactly. Um, yeah, become part of the conversation. I'm not unfriendly. I'm a very friendly person. So send me an email, explain to me why something doesn't work or how you want this format to be used. Because I think I just want people to share more information. So if I can help you share information and make the community a better place, that's all I want to do. So yeah, let's chat. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Jack. Yes, and I would also, uh, in the same line, basically, I think also if we submit our data in such a format or in a similar format, it will allow other researchers to discover applications of our materials in a much better and more exact way. And um, also to judge about the quality of research, of course, but also for the discovery of new applications. If you cannot see a logarithmic plot, then you cannot judge if this is a low pressure good performing adsorbent for let's say an environmental application and i think this will also uh, enhance the chances of improving and emerging applications in 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 the adsorption field for new materials so it's also i think an enabling um, technology okay then i would like to thank all participants um for the great contribution, discussion, active participation. I would like to thank Jack in particular for taking this chance. And I would like to thank Dan um, for also joining us today here as a panelist. And then I wish you all great health, take care, and um, hope to see you and please be involved in the discussion and um, happy to see you again in the, in the next webinar or conference. Thank you very much for joining today. Take care, everybody. And then I will close this yeah. webinar and meet Jack and Dan in another online meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.